Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Kathy Wellen. I'm the community ed director, and we're delighted to have you here for our final Many Faces of the Wiper Lake area. This one's on shifting demographics, baby boom, and migration from 1950 to the present. As part of that, we we have seven layer bars in the back because those came out you know, back in the day. And uh, there's only six layers because I don't like nuts, so. <laughs> you have to, you'll have to deal with that. Um, this is our shameless propaganda. So upcoming events and activities, you're invited to come and, and participate in anything that floats your boat, so to speak. And we're, we'd be delighted to have you. And I think, without further ado, I'll give you Sarah from the Wiper Lake Area Historical Society. Thanks, Kathy. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, how many of you have been to either of the first two sessions or both of the first two sessions? So quite a few. Don't worry if you weren't. You, there's, you'll be caught up just fine. It's not a big deal. Just like to get a sense of um, who's, who's been where. So, uh, so what we hope to accomplish this morning, uh, if you've been following along or uh, are, are new to the proj project and process, um, is an honoring of our legacy as a community a recognition of our past and the various and complex interactions that, ha that have and still play a role in who we are as a larger group. We approach this work with an attitude of respect and humility. There's much to be learned from our past for all of us. It's certainly been a learning experience for me on many of these um, pieces as we dive into different parts. Today's session is again intended to be a starting point, both taking us back with the story of our land and the human inhabitants of our area and bringing the impact forward to today. A starting point for conversations on where we've been, where we are today, where we are now, and ultimately where we as a community want to go in the future. With each session, we have added more layers and attempted to bring that collective story further into the present. As such, this three-part series uh, has touched on examples of our stories around the area over the centuries, beginning last fall with the Dakota and the Ojibwe, then this winter with um, our more uh, French-Canadian and European-based uh, immigrants who came in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And then today we'll be talking, uh, as Kathy said, about the post-World War II, essentially, baby boom, which was, no pun intended, huge. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the population surge that took place and then the more recent arrivals to our community. The uh, Historical Society has coordinated these presentations to base them in the history. And as we get into the more modern um, past, if you will, the more recent past, we have a lot of wonderful uh, statistical data that at that point I will turn over to Kevin because, you know, I'm not so hot with statistics. I like pictures and stories. Um, so we'll be doing that piece. And then um, continue on. It's my pleasure to be joined by a couple of members of our community who can help share from their personal and professional perspectives as we carry on. So the um, last session, make sure the technology is working. So at our, at our last session, we'll, we'll just give a quick recap. Uh, we talked a lot about the population growth and the, as things continued to um, build over the area. So we started out in about 1860 with the sentence, the sense, sentence, census, uh, and you can see the graph even changed as the communities, the shape of the communities around the lake changed during the decades. So in 1860, we had about 350 or so, a little over that, um, folks on both sides of the lake in a pretty significant area. The, those townships were 36 square miles. So if you can imagine Wiper Township um, at that point would have been all of Vadness Heights, Gem Lake, North Oaks, what is today the city of Wiper Lake and Wiper Township. And on the, the Washington County side, Greenfield Township would have been the same thing. It would have been a 36 square mile area as well. So um, not a lot of people here in 1860, as you can imagine. Uh, ultimately, as time went on, Things started to continue. You've got 50 years later, we are looking at uh, about 750 in the Washington County side and about 3,000 on the Ramsey County side uh, and still kind of within those larger boundaries. The, um, by 1930, if you add them all together, we have about 6,300 people. So we're going in, in leaps and bounds, sort of exponentially growing as time went on. Um, the 6,300 in 1930, is nothing compared to what it's going to be over the next few decades as we talk today. So, um, but just to give a little bit of a perspective there, it um, obviously continued to grow as people arrived, uh, but it's, it's amazing how 
fast things change from between the, the middle of that century. The next big shift uh, after the area turning from heavily resort community and summer community in about 1930 and, and people starting to live here year round, the next big shift took place, as I said, shortly after World War II. The population of the city of White Bear Lake itself in 1950 was uh, 3,646 people in 1950 with an area of 2.25 square miles because the city actually incorporated out of the township. So if you take that original 36 square miles in Ramsey County and incorporate the village of White Bear, which would eventually become the city of White Bear, it's really only a couple of square miles that we're talking about population there. By a decade later in 1960, that same area, or that the, um, the city of White Bear Lake had a population of 12,849 people. So going from 3,600 or so to almost 13,000 uh, in 10 years, and the land coverage um, increased to about seven square miles. So that went up as well, because a lot of the areas that were being, that were White Bear Township were being annexed into the city because they wanted water and sewer, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go. But uh, massive increase for the municipality that is the city of White Bear Lake in particular. And we will talk, in this first part, we will talk heavily um, about specifically the city of White Bear Lake because that's where the most significant changes happened, the most impactful, if you will. Um, during this time period, the 1950s, 1960s, uh, populations in general were shifting within larger cities, including St. Paul and Minneapolis, for a variety of reasons. The construction of Interstate 94 displaced many families, including those in the well-documented Rondo neighborhood. The growth of the civil rights movement and changes in legal codes, at least officially, increased access for all persons to housing that may not have been previously available. And the racial and cultural makeup of neighborhoods in the inner cities and the suburbs began to shift and change. Uh, I love this photo and it's included, it's, it's not a specific house or specific neighborhood exactly, it is the south side of White Bear. Um, it's, I believe, between County Road F and Cedar uh, in the 1950s. And you can, I love how tiny the trees are and how <laughs> you can see for blocks between the houses. Um, things are uh, definitely changing. That was all farmland, you know, probably a decade prior. And this is sort of the big overview of that whole thing. Uh, these shifts in, in demographics uh, played a role in the increased population in the White Bear area for sure. Additional factors also made us ripe for a population explosion like what we saw. White Bear was seen as a prime real estate for developers, um, such as Kenneth Backus and his company. Almost everything you see here, not everything, because there were other developers, but just about everything you see here on the south side was actually developed by, the ba by Backus Homes. Uh, that's a tremendous amount of land coverage and property. The, um, to give you a little orientation, this is McKnight Road heading to the lake. County Road E is up here, 244. This is Spruce Park on McKnight Road, so if you're familiar with that. Um, during this time period, it was actually a big drainage pond or holding pond because the, they were, had a lot of problems with water in those first developments. Um, but it's kind of stunning to see all of the roofs and, and literally almost no trees. There were some, Carol will talk about a little, um, but not a lot of those original old trees remained. Uh, so it's interesting to see. It's also interesting to look up off into the back and see how undeveloped it is in that direction as well. So uh, Bacchus, as I mentioned, had a significant impact on the construction and, and the population burst. The, uh, this headline is from 1960. Bacchus slates $8 million in home building for the area and the city council votes approval. There are a couple of interesting things that came out of that meeting or out of that article and, and this was one particular development. This is not his whole shebang. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because he, the Bacchus Homes in general was before the council and, and before the White Bear Town Board for White Bear Township constantly. I mean, it was almost every meeting for the 19, late 1950s and there was constant planning and constant building going on and a lot of back and forth. So one of the things that came out of this particular development um, was a requirement that for every home that Bacchus sold, they had to appropriate $50 for parkland for park development. So playgrounds, trails, whatever um, that they required. This particular development at $8 million in 1960 um, included 400 homes just that year. So if you can imagine how things were booming. Uh, the $8 million in 1960 is the equivalent roughly of $68.4 million today. So 
this was and this was actually this was it was being approved in December of 1960. It would have been built in 1961, but uh, they were getting their their pieces together. So. Um, and some of you may have lived in Bacchus homes or certainly know people who live in Bacchus homes. They are all over the place still. Um, these are a couple of different ads and other headlines for different neighborhoods in the, the, um, on the south side of town. Uh, Edgewood Park, Ridgeview Park, OJ Homes, uh, certainly Sunrise Park. There's lots of um, wonderful uh, names. But they were constantly busy from, from the 50s to the 70s in particular and, and continuing. The, um, they are one of the reasons that I think White Bear, that I believe White Bear grew like it did in that end of town, uh, grew like it did because building in that quantity can drive the price down. When you're building that, I mean, if you're building 20 homes, you have to charge a certain price. If you're building 400 to 800 homes a year, you can actually obviously get a, a much better discount or much better deal on lumber and construction and all of that. And, and of course, as you probably have realized as you drive down McKnight Road or some of the other streets, they were typically built on similar plans. They all have a little bit of variation, but they're, they're similar. Um, and so it was just that sort of uh, mechanization of the process. And so Bacchus homes were typically um, less expensive in a lot of ways than others. The other piece is that they marketed heavily. These, um, these photos are actually showing people lining up to go into the uh, Better Homes and Gardens Idea Home of the Year. So this house on Joy Lane on the top was a Better Homes and Gardens Idea Home and people literally lined up down the street to be, because it was featured in the magazine and uh, people wanted to see the, all the fancy new plans. Now one of my favorites, um, we live in a Rambler, it's not a Bacchus Rambler. It's on the west end of town. It wasn't a Bacchus Rambler, but it was built in 1956, so close to this time period, a little bit different floor plan. Um, but I was chuckling, but you can't quite make it out, I don't think. But in the items that they're promoting in their home designs is a space, a step saver kitchen. And I was laughing. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> if anyone has a Rambler kitchen, you know exactly what they're talking about. I, I was telling my husband, huh, if we ever sell the house, we can explain that you can touch every cupboard in the appliances by spinning around in circles. <laughs> It's a step saver. I'm not sure in this world of counting steps, that's a great thing. Um, but it was interesting marketing, to say the least. So the um, kind of entertaining. They had, they had other things like that as well, but um, it gave me a good chuckle. The uh, price there, $14,295 uh, included the lot. And of course, if you can make it out, they are promoting GI and FHA financing. They were very savvy. They, they knew how to give you the whole package and, and figure out how to get the money for you to pay for it um, and get things uh, up and going. In 1957, $14,295 is the equivalent of about $130,000 today. So again, cost effective. Um, it was definitely something they were looking for. The other piece that sets us apart a little bit as a community um, was 3M. 3M was pushing heavily to have people move into this area, uh, particularly the south side of the area. It was uh, in 1962, officially, that the first headquarters building for 3M opened in Maplewood. The, uh, they had been there for about 10 years prior to that with some of their um, buildings, but they officially moved their world headquarters, their global headquarters to, 3M, or to Maplewood. And it's not a coincidence that the eight miles of road that connect 3M Center to literally to White Bear Lake, the lake itself, is named McKnight Road for the CEO, longtime CEO of 3M, uh, William McKnight. The push was several of the um, executives and uh, board members had homes in Delwood and around the lake and, and liked this area. And so the push was to sort of fill in that area uh, in between as 3M employees, um, housing for 3M employees. The uh, story around 3M, I have a number of family members who've worked for 3M over the years, and the story was that uh, at one point, the, and this is not documented, um, but at one point they were going to rename the south end of White Bear as McKnightville. Uh, and they would actually, supposedly, when people were being recruited, they would actually bring them out and tour them all around the South End and, and encourage, again, encourage them to purchase homes out there. Uh, I don't know if that is true or if the, the, the employees decided that that was the appropriate thing to say. Um, so by 1970, so we talked about 1950 to 1960, and we were up to about 13,000 in the city of White Bear Lake in 1960. By 1970, the population had nearly doubled again. 
it was over 23,000. Um, the land area had gone up a little bit, but we were less than nine square miles at this point, so it wasn't a massive increase this time. Uh, and so it's kind of amazing when you think about it. This is actually the west side of town over in my neighborhood. Um, this is 1955, 1954, 1955. This is 4th Street that leads out of downtown White Bear, out toward Birch Lake. This is all still farmland, if you can imagine. And again, if you look over this way, um, over on the south end of town, things were not um, changing dra dramatic, drastically or dramatically yet. Um, and of course, if you look across the top, that whole east side of the lake is not developed either. So this is just on the cusp of massive changes um, that were going to be happening. And, and it's kind of mind boggling, really, when you start to look at things. Now, all of that growth can be wonderful in many ways, and it can cause all sorts of other problems um, as it happens. This meeting is a, this photo is of a meeting, it's actually from the um, St. Paul Pioneer Press, and it was a, a wonderful story on the uh, water issues. Like I said, water is a big deal, water is always a big deal, um, but this is a meeting at the Wiper Town Hall in July of 1956 to vote on, on certain water uh, issues that they were having. So, of course, as you can imagine, if you were in the township in the 50s, early 40s, early 50s, and you um, were functioning under the township system of, of water, you had wells and you had all sorts of things going on, um, and all of a sudden, new development was coming to your neighborhood or to your area, uh, and you could choose, there was handled in many, many different ways. There actually were as many as, we believe, 82 annexations and parcels pulled from the township to the city over the years. Um, and a couple of other cities, but the uh, the the, pro the challenge was, of course, one neighbor felt strongly that they wanted to hook up to city water and sewer and be part of the city. One neighbor said, "Nope, we don't want to do that. We don't want to pay for those fees, or we don't want to. We're happy the way it is." And it was literally um, neighbor against neighbor kind of situations. And so, as you can see, voting on this issue um, brought out crowds. Um, <laughs> We clearly have lines all over the place. Uh, and so it became, that was one of the contentious issues that, that went on um, for about a decade. Uh, and, and as actually, um, it's interesting, there are still hard feelings in some areas of the community um, because of those issues as time goes on. Other issues uh, involved infrastructure. If the community grows that rapidly, you need public safety, you need fire trucks, you need um, all sorts of things, you need police staffing. And so all new facilities essentially were needed, larger facilities, they didn't have to be new, but they had to be bigger. Um, so in 1961-62, the new fire station number one, which is still fire station number one, new, new um, municipal building was built in White Bear at uh, 2nd and 61. It was used as the city hall, as the police department, and as the fire station at that time. By the early 1970s, the population had grown so much on the other end of, of town, the other side of the lake, that they had to build fire station number two because the times to get and the staffing required to cover all that much territory. And of course, it wasn't just the city of Wiper Lake at that point, and, it, and it's still not. Um, for many decades, actually, for over a century, the, the fire department in particular, law enforcement's a little bit different, but the fire department in particular has worked all around the lake and provided fire services, fire protection all around the lake for many years um, and still does for certain parts. And so it's um, always important to be able to uh, have that, that infrastructure in place. The other key element, as you can imagine, when you bring in thousands and thousands of new homes uh, is schools. Schools are critical. And the... Um, uh, school boom was was quite dramatic. The uh, this got a chuckle at the session we did last week in the, at the White Bear District Center, but um, because it's about the White Bear schools specifically. But with the population explosion, the schools were woefully undersized. A 200-person citizen committee was formed to provide for input from the residents. Um, they're actually going through a similar process right now. Not quite that many people. They say it's about a 100-person uh, citizen committee. But as you can imagine. Large committees um, can make things interesting sometimes. Uh, it's good input. I mean, you get a lot of, of different input, which is good. But um, a $3.8 million bond was issued and a new high school building, the one you see on the right there, 
um, a new high school building with an award-winning circular design was constructed. That building, which is now North Campus in the White Bear Schools, could accommodate 1,800 students and was built at a cost of $3 million. The question was raised, and I didn't have this one um, calculated at the last one, but the question was raised, what was, what was $3.8 million in the early 1960s compared to today? It's $31 million, if you can imagine. So um, that's, a, that's a significant chunk. The, um, the school was built. It did actually win architectural awards for its design. Uh, if any of you have had students or have had meetings or anything else over there, been there yourself as a student or a parent, um, it's kind of entertaining. The, the story is, the, the joke is, of course, you just keep going because it's a circle and you just keep going until you find a classroom if you miss it. Um, I inevitably always enter the circle and go the opposite direction of which way I should, but um, it is what it is. So on the left, the upper left there is the original high school, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary um, t this year. The 100th anniversary of its graduating class, first graduating class was in uh, the first graduating class was in 1919, so we're celebrating 100 years of that. That building is today the White Bear um, Lake Area Schools District Center. The Central Middle School is attached to it um, in part of what was an expansion. It was, that building was originally built as the high school and expanded in the 1950s. That was an initial burst, an expansion in the 1950s, uh, and it has expanded since then for the middle school. Then in the 1960s, we got the new high school and then in the 1970s, on the lower right, if you keep going around like a clock, uh, the South Campus was built, or um, what is today South Campus, it was built as Mariner High School in the 1970s and lasted for about 10 years as a se completely separate high school building. So there were two separate structures that held uh, 9 through 12. And then the community decided that that system wasn't ideal. And so they whoops, merged the schools back together. Uh, and today, 9th and 10th grade is at North Campus and 11th and 12th is at South Campus. The, um, of course, in order to have all of these students come up into middle school and high school, you need lots of elementary schools as well. Uh, new elementary schools were added to serve the residents on the south end in particular, uh, and eventually there was a total of nine public elementary schools, two middle schools, and two high school campuses. So things were, were booming and growing quickly. In addition to all of that, uh, the downtown, the face of the downtown was changing. The um, library building, and, and again, it, I always feel like as we do these programs in the last few years, the um, cycles that happened in the 1950s and 1960s are repeating themselves. And that's part of where I think it's important to take a look back at some of these things. Because as I pointed a lot of these spaces, I say, you know, there's the new library from the 1970s. Well, of course, the new library was just redone a few years ago, the Ramsey County Library. Uh, but that is the, when it was being done in 1974. And um, of course, First State Bank on Clark Avenue is um, a wonderful example of a business that's been in downtown White Bear for many years, many decades. Uh, this was brand new in the 1960s at this location. It was fancy, it was cutting edge, it had a drive up window, all those wonderful things. Um, of course, today they don't need nearly as much space, as much real estate as they have because pe most people do their stuff electronically and don't always go in, or at least the vast majority of things are being done electronically. Uh, and other changes began to happen. Late industry was, was promoted and encouraged uh, and recruited to the community all around the area. We have Reynolds Aluminum up in the upper right. Uh, today that plant is um, over on 9th Street and it's international paper today, uh, just across from Podvin Park. But it was originally Reynolds Aluminum, um, which is kind of a fun one. And then uh, Polar Chevrolet was the first of many of the uh, White Bear Auto Strip dealers that moved out there and, and did so in, in a big splash. Interestingly enough, they moved out there uh, and, and really had a big push um, in the early 60s along County Road F and, and Highway 61. We have been getting calls recently because the business has been sold in the last few years and they're looking to revamp their building and, and redo things and uh, they're trying to figure out what was done in the 60s because there's a lot of rules and regulations because they're so close to Goose Lake in particular and so now they're studying how you know what, what are they grandfathered in on and what rules do they have to adapt to because things have changed dramatically since Polar went in um, and one of the questions is uh, and we think we're keeping the bear but is that a big deal? <laughs> yes! Yes, <laughs> you may not be staying in White Bear if you don't. <laughs> so anyway, um, interestingly enough, with all of those things going on, 
and the growth push, um, one of the big uh, hot things in the 1950s and 60s, and, and it still goes on actually, is a competition called the All-America City, which is sponsored by Look Magazine and uh, the National Municipal, Municipal League. Uh, in 1957, White Bear was a runner-up for All-America City. Uh, by 1964, they actually were named All of America City. They had a lot of work to do between 1957 and 1964. I think when they started applying and, and thought the community committee had thought that they had done a lot in the 50s. Um, I'm not sure they really had any idea what they had left to do. They, they still, many of those schools still needed to be built. Uh, all of the uh, municipal infrastructure changes, the fire stations and things still needed to be done. Um, they also had a series of, this is what a number of the buildings in the downtown area looked like in the late 1950s, early 1960s, believe it or not. Um, and it's interesting, uh, I, I often to remind people that yes, I'm a preservationist, but I'm also a realist, and not everything has to be saved. Um, this building is wonderful, it's kind of cute, but it, it, it's not practical and certainly not safe. Uh, there were 11 or 12 buildings similar to this that were taken down in downtown White Bear during the early 1960s. Um, they actually made way for those parking lots uh, behind or along Banning and 3rd, and fourth um, and or fifth and banning, I guess more so um, in particular, and they really kind of cleaned things up. It was initiatives like that that again won recognition from the All America City Committee, but also reminded people that this is a good place to live. And, and the slogan, um, the city of friendly people and good living. Uh, it, White Bear was very much in a tradition of promoting itself. We did not, we were not a suburb that sat back and said, oh, you know, the sprawl will happen, people will come. Um, we were a small town in our own right, and, and that really includes theory all around the lake because the, the boundaries are squishy and, and people come and go and, and recognize themselves in many ways around the lake. But the, um, that tradition from the resort days of promoting and sending pamphlets and, and information and promotional materials down the Mississippi River on the, so those people would come up on the steamboats to St. Paul and then take the trains out here. Um, that whole concept never ended. It just continued to shift and change and the things that we were promoting uh, continued on. So that's an ongoing thing. Now, again, growing pains. Um, the, uh, this is always kind of entertaining to me, um, and, it's, and it, there was, there really truly was, um, there was actually some gang problems in the 1950s, early 1960s uh, in, in the area. There were a number of challenges, and so, you know, as you see, the headline says youth problem in White Bear. Um, instead of just kind of letting it play out or whatever, a committee was formed, lots of committees, uh, but a committee was formed, and a number of things came out of that. Uh, there was a youth um, resource bureau that had activities like a youth center uh, that allowed for good places for kids to hang out. But in addition to that, some of the th that, that has faded away. There really isn't something like that exactly. We have the YMCA and other um, places uh, that are a little bit structured a little bit differently. But in addition to that, the playground programs, the community services program in White Bear popped out in the mid-60s. Youth sports, a lot of our sports associations began at that point to give younger people um, good things to do instead of running around and, and being kind of crazy and, and doing whatever kids do when they don't have structured good things to do. So. Uh, <laughs> With that, uh, it's my pleasure today to invite him. We will do question. We will do some Q and A at the end. So if there are questions or comments or stories you want to share, um, please do. Uh, but uh, with that, I'd like to invite Carol Venberg McFarland up. Uh, Carol, Carol, I, I can give you the stats and the quick photos and the overview. Carol gives you the personal touch because she lived <laughs> it. <laughs> well, thank you, Sarah, and everybody for being here. It's really kind of fun. Uh, I did this last week at the White Bear. Uh, district center and so I had time to kind of refresh it a little bit <laughs> since then. Um, it was really fun to prepare for it and to kind of do a reflection on my own life and mine is only my experience but I you know it's fun to share it with people. So I'm going to follow my outline please you know <laughs> bear with me because I'm going to give you some reflections and some random tidbits of being somebody who was a, a child growing up in White Bear, having been a parent of ch three children in White Bear schools, and then being a grandparent of eight grandchildren now in the White Bear area. So um, it all started when uh, Keith and Irene Benberg uh, moved to White Bear Lake in 1959. Uh, we had the uh, split level up on the upper left-hand side, 
Mom uh, was telling me the other day that they were, did it on the GI Bill. It was the most that they could afford. Uh, four kids only had three bedrooms, so then, of course, the uh, third level and the basement were unfinished. And so they did finish the uh, family room level so that my brother could have a bedroom. And, uh, and then, you know, that's one of the things you remember about those homes, the unfinished basements where you'd have your Girl Scouts and all the neighbors would come and play together. Um, my, oh, and then you could see later how we, we added on, uh, no, go back. We added on um, and put on a garage because at that point, any houses built east of, of uh, McKnight did not have to have a garage when they were built. The ones west had to. Little tidbits that you find out through the years. So, and then of course, trees started up. The other thing when, when I look at this, when the houses east of McKnight and going north, there were none. So from our house, you could see the lake. And that's on the corner of Birch and McKnight. So that was kind of fun. Um, also, I wanted to mention on the Bacchus homes, uh, I don't know that many people know that Kenny Lane, Randy Avenue, and Joy Lane were named after Bacchus children. So just little tidbits here. Um, there were many families that came to town. A lot of them were growing families. A middle class neighborhood, yes, it was a 3M bedroom community. Um, I would say that one of the things is that the families in our neighborhood that came together uh, are still friends today because of that bond. They were all starting out together. They were all raising their kids together. And even though they've moved away, they still are good friends. Uh, this is my uh, picture of us uh, in 1960. So that's the year after we moved in. Uh, myself, my brother Keith, Kendra, who's right over here right now too, she came today, and my sister Christine. So, um, there were also things I remember about growing up in that area. Clotheslines, you hung your clothes out to dry. Um, there were uh, no fences, so when the kids went out to play, you didn't have to worry about fences. There were no trees, except for I would say that there were groves of trees where the farm, farms were, and so the house we're currently living in has big oak trees that have wells around them because they built the house, they, they lifted it up and kept the trees, but they put wells around them to save them. Um, Remember walking uh, from our house to the soda fountain, the uh, drugstore, uh, down on County Road E and White Bear Avenue, Sunrise Park area. Learning to swim at Bel Air Beach. Uh, walking across before Lake Ayers was built, walking across the fields to go to the corner store. It was kind of fun. At that time, moms, most moms were at home and not, not working. Uh, very few had cars. So a lot of things happened right around your neighborhood. Um, also, at the same time, a lot of churches were being built because when you bring people in, <laughs> that's the other part that grows. And so my mother-in-law was a founding member at St. Pius, and we were uh, at Parkview. And uh, you know, I remember our church being built, and then I remember the next phase was an addition because there were so many kids. So uh, there, these places are still around. So I, when I came here, uh, I attended Bel Air Elementary School. Um, for fourth and fifth grade. Um, and because of all the growth, they built Lake Ayers Elementary. And that's where I was um, at, in sixth grade. And Shirley LeFave here, you, you were there that first year, right? Yep, 51. And I think you were there 25 years later when my, grand, my son was, I was PTO president and my son was in sixth grade. Yeah, I was there. You were there. <laughs> Shirley's a rock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and there were a lot of schools like Lake Ayers that were built on the south side. There was Golf View, Park View, Willow, uh, because of all this growth. Uh, Sunrise Junior High then was built, and I attended there 7th, 8th, and 9th grade. I remember distinctly having the 7th, 8th, and 9th grade hallways. Um, and then I also remember that girls could not wear pants to school. And so I remember frostbite walking from my house to, to Sunrise. I mean, it was, it was a real problem. And I guess you could have worn pants under your skirts, but you know, it was you know, kind of the wrong thing to do. Anyway, I uh, also remember the announcement of President Kennedy's assassination when I was at school. It was a Friday, I remember. Um, then I went on to attend the new round school, 
which was our new high school, now, now North Campus, for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and I graduated in 1968. We had about 525 people in our class, which was quite a jump from what it used to be. Um, I also remember going in circles till you found your class. Uh, I remember the trying out of a new um, educational program called Modular Scheduling. Um, as a senior, it, it, it wasn't a good year to start it, but anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll not say anymore. Uh, we had an AFS student from um, Japan that lived with us. I remember things like uh, the computer class we took was to do computer punch cards, <laughs> and that we had the big electric typewriters, and I also learned shorthand. Um, and what I want to say about that is at the last event, I came home, and afterwards we were talking with a few people, and Lonnie Bonin, who lives in Montemita here, um, works in the school district, she is my daughter's mother-in-law. And I get this cute little note card in the mail, and I'm thinking, oh, that's nice of Lonnie to send me a note. And I open it up, and it's in shorthand. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, if anybody can read this, it's been fi over 50 years since I've done this, so maybe somebody can help translate this for me. So, anyway. Um, and then I'd, I'd like to say, too, no matter, and, and I know this is a white bear-centric thing, but no matter where you lived in the area, uh, it whatever community you were from in the White Bear School District, we were the bears. So, um, from there then I went to attend the new Lakewood State Junior College. And that was in the old Washington uh, school on 4th Street in White Bear. Uh, I was the second year, they, they had been there one year before and I attended the second year. Um, I graduated from there before they moved to their new location on Century Avenue. Um, then I wanted to talk about my husband's family. My husband, Pat McFarlane, uh, his parents, LT and Dorothy McFarlane, uh, lived in this house on County Road E when there was a service lane in front of those homes between Ebba and McKnight. Uh, this house was on the historic house tour in 2016, and that's why you've got the new version. It didn't have all that landscaping back then. Um, <laughs> but the house is pretty much the same. In fact, I would tell you that one of the things that the new owners liked about it was it was this very retro because uh, things were there like still pink tiles and pink toilets and things like that, you know. So, um, and and it, they moved in that house in 1955 and it was a model home. And he remembers distinctly um, that no homes on either side, they were built every other house. It was built by Anderson Builders um, and it was quite a financial uh, stretch for them to move to White Bear. He was, they had lived in Stillwater. And so you have my husband, Pat, his older sister, Linda, you have Joe and Peggy. So my father-in-law was a scoutmaster with Troop 91. And this was a troop that had a lot of uh, World War II veterans that came home. And those people learned how to camp and they learned how to do a lot of stuff. And um, uh, they had a lot of competitions with other scout troops in the area. And, but I, I, my husband recalls that where Festival Foods is now is where they used to go camping because it was a hillside and it was trees and everything. So um, at that time, McKnight Road uh, ended at Gall Golf Course, and which is now Manitou Ridge. And, uh, it, and of course, uh, and my husband golfs there today, I mean, even today. Um, <laughs> uh, there was no 694. Um, he recalls from his house, they would, he would have to walk to St. Pius. That's a long walk today. I don't think anybody would be required to do that these days. Um, also, he remembers tiger salamanders and frogs in the window wells. I don't know how many you see anymore. Um, we don't. <laughs> um, his aunt and uncle, Dick and Eileen Redpath, were in, White, in Montemidai here, and so we would come over here, and of course his cousins, um, Jim, John, and Joni. And uh, so we have great memories of the area. Um, I graduated in 68, my, grad, my husband graduated in 67, and um, our sisters went to uh, Mariner, which was that 10 year gap and then it closed. Um, Pat and I dated in high school and we you know, went off and did other things and then Pat joined the Navy. And after three years, and so there's some people, I don't know if you'd recognize, anyway. Most of the family's in there, I think except Chris. Okay, anyway, um, 
So in his last, he was a hospital corpsman, and he, in his last year of service, for his service, uh, he had to go to um, Marine boot camp. And I sent him a letter. Of course, then you weren't calling and you weren't texting or anything. And I sent him a letter, and I said, if you wanted to get married when you were home on your leave, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we planned the wedding in five weeks. And we got married on New Year's Day because that was the only day that was open if you're going to plan late. And, um, <laughs> and so we got married. Um, we were one of the first ecumenical weddings in the White Bear area where the priest came to our church to, to help with the service. Um, that was a thing of the day. I mean, I, I didn't realize how um, important that was until I started reflecting on things, how things have really changed. Um, and I remember distinctly, because it was on New Year's Day, that's a football day. <laughs> and, and there were men with their transistor radios in the, in the church because they didn't want to miss the game. And, and so I also remember then going to the uh, uh, White Bear Rod and Glen Club afterwards for a dance. And that's no longer there. So, um, so anyway, then we moved up to Duluth for uh, a little bit, and then we moved back for over 40 years ago now to, ra to raise our family. Um, our three children were raised in White Bear Lake. Uh, we've lived on Van Dyke and on Southwood. Southwood is another back of split level. Um, that's from my, when my daughter got married. Um, so we have a lot more grandchildren than that now with eight of them. But anyway, I can see that. That's Scott Bonin here from Matamidi. That's the, my son-in-law <laughs> in the center. Um, so uh, let's see, all of, we have eight grandchildren ages 4 to 20 now. Uh, both my husband and I have been very active in the community for many years um, and uh, he's been involved with hockey, Rotary, YMCA, I've been involved with the school boards, a lot of community organizations, I was a state legislator for a few years and now I continue to be active in a lot of other organizations. I have flunked retirement. Um, <laughs> So, um, why don't we do the picture now? So, this is my mom this year. She moved back to White Bear and lives in the Arbors. And I want to read the sign to you. 27 below with a 48 below wind chill. This is this last winter. Uh, wearing an outfit she purchased from Montgomery Wards in the 1960s. Warm, she says. And that was January 30th of this year. Uh, <laughs> And then my mother-in-law, Dorothy, is living at Serenity uh, in the care center. So, um, Throughout all the years, um, I've experienced a lot of changes, in, and we have all experienced changes in this community. Uh, one constant is the friends and the neighbors and the volunteers in our community. What I'd like to say is one of the, the phrases that I coined for the Greater White Bear Lake Community Foundation is uh, we're the communities that share the shores of White Bear Lake and that really unifies us as a really great community. And when I was in the legislature, I found that I related better to people from Greater Minnesota and I think that's because I realized that we're more like a rural community surrounded by the suburbs. And so with that, I leave you and I thank you for letting me share my story. Hello everyone, my name is Kevin Donovan. I think I've got a, yeah, I do have a little slide that kind of says who I am and what I do. Uh, I, Molly and I moved to this community uh, in 1995 to a grant just north of here. And uh, I've been privileged to serve on the Montemedi School Board for the last 14 years. And there's a woman over here, Alice Smith, that uh, kind of helped recruit me way back in the day. And uh, I'm very privileged to do that. I also serve as the development director for our education foundation. And uh, I have been a part of the uh, Area Foundation Leadership Tomorrow program. So a little, that's a little bit. Um, I started, I was born in Tallahassee, Florida in 1958. And so how in the world I ended up in Minnesota well, I do know. My, my parents were academics at FSU, and in 1958, things were changing for the good down in that neck of the woods, in that area of the South. Uh, civil rights was coming on, and, but at the time, it was uh, rather uh, 
it was it was tough for people that had different views than Jim Crow. My parents had different views, and so they ended up with a brick through the window, and a decision was made to do a search for a new place to live. And uh, they they had Minnesota and Winnipeg. I'm forever grateful that they chose Minnesota. <laughs> There is something I want to share, the book, the book, the book, the book. I think you have it underneath the paper here. Right. Best laid plans. So I, I want to uh, say here and now that I am not the expert in this neck of the woods, but there is a book, Matamidi Memories, and I don't know if it's at the library, it might well be, but I know, uh, again, Alice is co-author of this and a lot of great history of Matamidi in this book, so I encourage people to seek that out, and I'm told at some point there is going to be a revision, um, possibly. So, so uh, let's see if I can run this little deal here. So I'm here to talk about uh, demographic trends and um, last week I got a call saying, hey, we need somebody to give this presentation. The guy that, that did this work from Wilder Foundation wasn't able to be here. So uh, the call went out and, Kevin, would you be willing to do this? Little did I know there were going to be 35 slides uh, <laughs> with all sorts of data. So, so go easy on the uh, uh, person that's just... Uh, going through something that Wilder's done. And I, I actually have added a few things, and I, and I will hope to share a few stories that will flesh some of this out. But the Wilder Foundation exists. One of the things they do is they do demographic studies for communities. And you can, I think, go online and seek this information out if you're interested in some of this material. But it helps uh, people, policymakers, make decisions based on facts. And uh, uh, that's very important as we see the things changing, it's important to make decisions based on the trends and the facts that are out there. So this uh, particular thing was put together by Wilder for the Leadership Tomorrow program, which is uh, an, uh, something that the Greater White Bear Lake Area Community Foundation has um, put together, sponsored with the White Bear Rotary and um, the White Bear Chamber of Commerce. And uh, so currently we have 22 people going through this, uh, this program. And so in January, which was the start, this uh, um, deck was shown and with explanation. So I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to uh, move and go through this. Let's see here. Here we go. So the, this is school building. This used to be the old high school. So uh, which of these, we have to have a, a quiz, right? Have to. So which of, the, uh, of these population dynamics is having the most impact on our community? So A, aging population, B, increasing uh, racial and ethnic diversity, and C, domestic and international migration. A? Well, well, I'm hearing actually some good answers there. So, uh, but but the, the primary driver that we have is we're getting older. Now, as far as I'm concerned, when I saw that slide, I'm like, well, it's better than the alternative. <laughs> but, um, and, and as evidenced by our audience today, we all are uh, getting a bit older. And um, so that really is driving a lot of different decisions that are being made um, in our communities today. So in this slide, they're talking about the aging of Minnesota. And there's an interesting, when I saw this without really going through the data, but if you look at the metropolitan area, it's, it's that grayer mass there. And there are less uh, elderly, I gotta be careful on elderly, people over 65 as a percentage of the populations. There, it's, it's, there's less of that in the metropolitan area than in greater Minnesota. So, again, not to spoil this, but as we go for, uh, further along in this, I think it'll become clear why. So this is historic. I mean, we all have heard for years the baby boom 
discussion, and I'm on the tail end of the baby boom, and uh, we've we've heard about uh, just how many people are are in our demographic, and and at some point they're going to be retiring in mass, and that really is that started uh, what ten years ago, and it's just really going strong now, and um, so we're seeing that big growth in the, in that demographic. Um, the inverse, which I, I didn't have, I don't have that slide, but I've seen this slide done elsewhere, is the fact that we have a workforce shortage. And so if the preponderance of our population is older in, and uh, in the baby boom, uh, it would stand to reason that we have less people in the earlier years where they're out seeking jobs. And uh, it's really, really a problem for Minnesota and other states, but uh, particularly for Minnesota, and I will hopefully share some ideas for how we might fix that a bit. So this slide talks about the share of older adults 65 plus in Greater White Bear Lake. And uh, when I when I saw this slide, I mean it seems to make some sense. And uh, again, the East Metro lower, and again remember that gray shaded area in the map of Minnesota. Um, but the thing that I live in Grant, and uh, the thing, 23% in Grant. And, and why is that? Um, and so the only thing that I really could come up with was the fact that that Grant still has um, some agricultural and long-term families have been in Grant for years. And so unlike White Bear or Montemedi, uh, there may be some people that are just, as we call, aging in place um, and a little bit higher in grant. But again, I don't know that for fact, so that's just my, that's just my speculation there. So here are some things that are happening, and it's not an exclusive uh, list by any means, but uh, there are some things happening to try to meet the needs of people that are in that 60 plus category and the school districts uh, have great programming going on white bear and monomedi and i'm going to do now a shameless plug for you got that pink sheet i'm going to do a shameless plug for the community luncheon there is one more in may the food is catered from roma it's seven bucks it's the best deal out there so <laughs> and it's right here so you no excuse of not finding it. it's right here so that the date should actually be on your list. But um, these things are, are happening and the White Bear Senior Citizen, they're doing all sorts of programming as well. Uh, New Tracks Transportation is a uh, nonprofit that has sprung up. They, they're located on White Bear Lake and they do transportation uh, around in our communities. We have some problems with uh, transportation um, kind of locally and so New Tracks provides some of that uh, transportation from uh, senior communities to Walgreens or festival or what have you. That was an interesting fact about festival it used to be a place where people camp. Uh, when I worked there I didn't camp but uh, okay and so then the emergency food shelves uh, there in Montemedi and White Bear do great work to make sure that all of our citizenry is uh, able to get access to food when in need. Uh, the White Bear Chamber of Commerce, and this is an interesting one, there's a, a move afoot, actually there's a meeting on Thursday to look at autonomous vehicles in our communities. And uh, one might ask how that might be uh, good for people that are a little older. And I would say as a guy that just finished cataract surgery last month, uh, having an autonomous vehicle to drive me around when I couldn't see so well would, would be a really great thing. Um, and so that's coming. Uh, that is absolutely coming, whatever, whatever your opinions are on that, that is going to happen. Um, and then um, trying to make some of our uh, community places more uh, uh, fully accessible to all of our, our folks. The next we're going to move into how our population is changing and it's aging and race. We are getting more racially and ethnically diverse. Probably you have seen that firsthand out and about. Growth among all populations of color, uh, we've, we've seen, and you can see the areas, the, the uh, black, 
the Hispanic and the Asian populations have grown rapidly uh, in the last few years. So here's the next question for the test. Of all the residents in the East Metro, how many out of 10, so it'll be a number less than 10, of course, are persons of color? I haven't heard it yet. I heard it. It's three. It's three. So now we're talking about the East Metro. So obviously, you know, we're talking East Side, uh, Maplewood, I mean, a lot of different uh, Woodbury, what have you. So, um, and now how that's going to look in our area. So yes, three is correct. So here's the growth um, over the last 25 years. And you can see it's quite a trend line. And, and here it's broken out in greater White Bear Lake area, again, probably defined by the shores of White Bear Lake. And the East Metro, in aggregate, 26%. Uh, but then you can see some of the other, of our local communities and, and their percentages of people of color. Culturally diverse. So when we're, I'm sure you're seeing this as well. So immigration is one of these things that's gotten a lot of, a lot of press uh, lately. And you can see that I, I, I'm curious what the press back in the 1860s was doing on this. Because you can see in Minnesota the green line, the pale green line, huge migration in. And this was that you know, air, there was nothing really here, and so there was land aplenty, and, and people were encouraged, and letters back home to Sweden and Norway were, come to Minnesota, and uh, it's a great place. And uh, the, the, the lines now, now have changed, so the uh, immigration into Minnesota has, is less as a percentage of the nation as a whole. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, there's, you know, we're seeing evidence of that as well. But even though we are giving a, an increase now from 1970 to, to today at 9% here in Minnesota, uh, it was nothing like it, it was in days of old. Okay, another uh, question. Uh, how many foreign born people are there in the East Metro? I see two, anybody else? Do I hear one? One. Minnesota is home to 486,000 foreign born residents, 30% of whom live in the East Metro. And you can, you can see that number in St. Paul. And so uh, having lived in St. Paul for a great number of years, uh, do you remember University Avenue 1975. Anybody remember what university looked like in 1975? Was it, was it really thriving? Was it beautiful? Was it a safe place? Was it some place that families would want to go hang out? No. And I would maintain, this is again my own personal theory, so take it for what that's worth, we had a huge influx of, of a certain population back in that time period, uh, the Hmong. And, and St. Paul was one of the three areas in our country. There was a place out in California, uh, um, Wausau, Wisconsin, and St. Paul were the three areas where most of the Hmong came. A lot of it was based on religious. Uh, churches would sponsor and then the word said, hey, kind of like the Swedish Norwegians come to Minnesota, it's a great place. They didn't, they didn't mention the weather program, but anyway, so many of our, and, and I would, my personal theory here, so, is that St. Paul was a real benefit of that influx migration of Hmong. Because if you go to university today, if you're on the green line and you go scooting along, what are you going to see after you leave the capital area? You're going to start heading west. What are you going to see? You're going to see all these different shops grocery stores and rest. Oh man, that's where I go for food. I love to go down to the university and get some good stuff. Um, but 
people have invested, the people in that community have invested in starting businesses, and it's thriving, it's vibrant, and it's safer than it used to be. Oh man, I remember that, it was tough, tough stuff. Um, so again, I think, not to do too much editorializing, but I think in St. Paul's instance, we were a net benefit of, of people migrating in. So this uh, slide sh shows how different the United States uh, breakout is compared to the East Metro. And the big, the big one that really stands out, of course, is the blue one, which is the Asian, radically different than, than a nation as a whole. And again, due to probably the, the Hmong uh, coming to St. Paul. So here's a, here's a little a trivia question for you. What Toyota dealership, this is easy, but what Toyota dealership in the United States is the largest? Maplewood, why? McDay, I think the, 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 the chap that owns it is Mr. McDaniels, and he understood, and some of his staff understood at a very early point that they need to be receptive. If they want to capture business, they need to be receptive to the needs of the people that are going to potentially shop there. So right away they employed some Hmong Asian salespeople. Purchasing of cars is done slightly differently in that culture, although I don't know how, how many cars they had back when they were in, in Asia because they were mountain people typically. And, but today, the car is a fact of our life, and so it's pooling of money to buy vehicles. And so if it's my turn to get the car, people give me money, I go buy it. We don't do it on time, you just buy the car. And so then when it's uh, Sarah's turn, then we give the money there. And so they understood that. And then they started hiring uh, mechanics, technicians that were also mom. And they are the biggest. I thought, wow, this is really an amazing fact. You'd think it would be California or something like that, but no, it is Maplewood Toyota. So uh, again, this, this one talks about uh, share of foreign-born residents in greater White Bear Lake area. It's, no, you know, it's just not surprising that the numbers are lower from the East Metro in aggregate. Uh, in Montemidai, we have uh, some recent immigrants to our country, primarily from Somalia. And the schools have tailored some of their outreach specifically for that uh, group of people. Uh, their trust in local government is low, for good reason. And um, so that translates to people coming here, the, the look at Montemidai schools as local government, which we are, and we do outreach. We want to go out to the people that don't maybe fully trust us yet just because of their own historical experience. So uh, foreign-born uh, headed households, uh, you know, this is not really surprising either. Higher percentage of people renting, larger household size. Okay, so I'm getting, coming back to that gray area of the metropolitan area. So people that um, come to this country typically will have larger family sizes. Uh, and so that, that skews that data in the metropolitan area. Um, and then lower uh, access to vehicles, and this kind of touches back to that's a that's probably an area a challenge that we face in this neck of the woods is having transportation to get students to Century College or uh, to some of the other activities in White Bear Lake. So the greater uh, Minneapolis St. Paul area has the highest uh, number one of the 25 largest number one adults working it's back to that workforce issue. We don't have enough folks, although we do, and I'll explain that in a sec. Uh, lower poverty rate, the low, lowest poverty rate at 2%, and educational attainment. This one kind of surprised me. I thought we'd be, uh, you know, second or third, but we're not. Uh, educational attainment at, at, at number six. So we all went through the Great Recession, and it has affected people unequally as one might think. Uh, so 
East Metro, East Metro residents uh, below poverty, 11%. East Metro children, 15%. East Metro residents of color, 22%. And then uh, children of people of color, children of color at 28%. Uh, it's, this is a tough slide to look at. And there's a percentage of greater White Bear Lake residents living below poverty. Uh, we, we have uh, in Delwood one of the highest, if not the highest, uh, one of the highest socioeconomic communities. Uh, only a thousand people, so um, not a big one, but they, uh, it's a pocket of people of privilege. And uh, you can see the other ones here too, not terribly surprising. So cost burden households, um, you can imagine, you know, one of the measures of how well you're doing is what percentage of your income you're putting into your housing. And it's not surprising that uh, younger uh, put a higher percentage because they're not making as much, higher percentage into that. But I'm curious about the one for 65 plus. Anybody have maybe any thoughts on that? Yep, yep. Yeah. Anything else? Does anybody make their home in one of the retirement uh, housing complexes that we have many of in our? So, I, I know my dad's 89, and uh, he he moved to Minneapolis. Which again, usually people that are in St. Paul will move to the East, the East Metro, and uh, so when Dad said I'm moving to Minneapolis, I'm like, whew. Something wrong, Dad. You're going to Minneapolis. That's not where you're supposed to go. And he told me all the reasons. And he said, and finally, I'm sighted a, a quarter block from Sebastian Joe Ice Creamery. And I said, Dad, that is a stroke of genius. That's brilliant. So actually, his church is right across the street on half Penn, so that's the real reason. But, uh, but I know how much he pays for his place. $3,700, and it's not a fancy, it's only a two bedroom, it's not a fancy place, $3,700. So that's gonna skew some of that as well, I think. And uh, so anyway, this one is pretty, pretty self-explanatory as well. Now I'm gonna go into the Montemedi Public Schools. One little bit of trivia, which I didn't hear get brought up on White Bear, but the uh, the round school building that's 9, 10, and uh, then there's the 11, 12. I've had, had occasion to go over to the round building, and I've gotten lost, too. I take string in my pocket now when I go. <laughs> but that, that model, there are only five school districts in the entire country that use that model of 9, 10, 11, 12. Five. So just a little bit of trivia that I thought interesting. So in Matamidi, um, there's been this feeling, and it's most, mostly true, that we're not very diverse. Uh, but we are getting more diverse, as the slides are indicating. And so when my kids went to Wildwood and OH, um, it was pretty much a European-centric, uh, you know, people of European heritage uh, had, had kids at the schools, and it looked that way. And now it, it does look different. So if you ever have a chance to go over to one of our schools, uh, I think you'll see uh, some, some real positive change in that, in that domain. And one of the things that um, is talked about is the number of teachers of color that teach students, or students of color. In Minnesota, we have 33% of our students in public school, 33%. And the number is 847,000 students in total. 33% of our students are students of color. How many, what percentage of teachers, and I don't know the number of how many teachers, I'm just going to say 70,000 for lack of a, a thing, but what percentage of our teachers in Minnesota are teachers of color? 4.2. So, um, you know, again, there's very strong and compelling evidence that if you are a student of color, you should at least once in your uh, school career see someone that looks like you. So, 
Uh, here's, the, here's the numbers. This one's easy to see in the enrollment, which Matamida is not growing in enrollment. And uh, so that's something that may be out there that we're growing or not. Uh, we, we have a number of our facilities say this many students, 3,300 or so. Um, we're not really growing beyond that. We don't want to grow beyond that. Um, and uh, we, we just want to make sure we have the right capacity, we're right sized. And we've said 1,200 students is the perfect high school size. And from that, then we draw all the other uh, students in to fill that 1,200. Um, there's the share of special education, a free and reduced lunch, uh, English language learners. I think both of those numbers are just a little higher than what, now than when that was put out. Um, and uh, this next one, number of languages spoken is an interesting one. White Bear, it's 49. In Matamidi, it's 24. Uh, which, that really rings true. I mean, that really feels like a, uh, but it's, it's interesting to me that we would have 28, uh, 24 languages spoken in the home. And uh, the number of teachers, so. Okay, one more slide. This is a shameless plug for the 2020 census. Please, 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 when your time comes, fill it out. As a person that loves genealogy, I live on these things. And the new one is about to, the 1951 is about to come out in a year. I'm so excited for that. But um, do your part and be a part of this because it does help when we make, again, decisions. Policy decisions are based on who people are and where they're coming from. So thank you all for coming and being a part. Hopefully, uh, maybe we'll have a few, time, a few minutes for some questions. Fantastic. And Carol, you may get questions too, so we'll pull you back up. Bye. Anybody have questions on the historical piece or the, the demographic piece? Why do we have these pockets of right here Township? <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> because, so in, in 1858, when Minnesota became a state, uh, in 1858, when Minnesota became a state, Labor Township was formed. And it was a proper con congressional township, so it was six miles on each side, uh, 36 square miles. And in 1881, the village of White Bear was incorporated out of the township, which was primarily the business district, the downtown area, and along the lakes. And their main goal, interestingly enough, or their main purpose of incorporating was in order to enforce or to create and enforce regulations on things like liquor, billiards, uh, any gambling, dancing, things like that, that the townships didn't have the authority to do. So with the resort community happening, things were getting a little rowdy and they wanted to be able to control some of those aspects. From there, uh, the villages and, and ultimately the cities of Gem Lake, uh, Vadnais Heights, and and not, not out of Wiper Township, because that's, that's in the Washington County side, but um, Jim Lake, Vadnais Heights, whom I miss, uh, North Oaks, uh, incorporated out of the township as well. And since that time, there have been 82 annexations pulling, the, primarily because of the development that happened in the 50s and 60s, pulling little pockets and neighborhoods that wanted to attach to, the, to the, those cities, not just with the city of Wiper Lake, but to those various cities. And so what's happened is we have all these little parcels, five little parcels of Wiper Township that are left sitting independently. Uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, there was actually a movement and it was um, the, the, essentially the entirety of the township was annexed to the city of White Bear Lake for a little while. The, the township effectively ceased to exist and the residents came back and said, wait a minute, we didn't agree to that. The, the, they, they actually fought it. They took it to the Minnesota Supreme Court and said uh, that vote wasn't taken properly. There wasn't proper notice. There wasn't, there were certain things, certain technicalities that were a challenge. And so it was actually overturned um, and, and the township was reinstated as it had been, uh, which is kind of unusual and, and um, an interesting piece. The, um, and the township residents for the most part have, have worked hard to maintain that independence and that separate piece. So that's a really long answer to a <laughs> relatively simple question. But one of my favorite things is if you take the township map and you actually put the lake, the body of water back in, 
it kind of reconnects most of what's there. There's a, there's the little spot up by um, County Road J, but the theater and that, that doesn't pop quite back in there, but it'll connect uh, the White Bear Beach on the north side to Bel Air Beach on the south side, and, and some of those neighborhoods sort of flow back together. But if you take, yeah, if you're using just those boundaries, it's an interesting little area. <laughs> so living in the city of Grant, which I do, when we first moved here in 1995, it was Grant Township. And there was a concern because Delwood was nibbling away and taking pieces of Grand Township. And so the idea that it's easier as a township to be, what's the right term, annexed? Would that be the correct term? Annexed or incorporated. Incorporated. And so if you're a city, it's much harder to do that. And so the folks in, in Grant said, hey, we got to be a city. Well, and, and my personal belief is White Bear Township probably would have become a city if the name White Bear Lake the city of White Bear Lake hadn't already been taken because they don't want to change their name um, <laughs> to something different. That, that's my opinion. Others disagree. But I think um, th what has happened over the years, they've actually fought for urban um, powers, which means that the cities within, the cities have lots of other authorities that townships don't have. And so um, townships within the metro area have been able to actually acquire different authorities through that, through uh, lots of processes and it's it's been a um, it's been it's very complicated and I, we're actually talking about doing a presentation just on that but I have to do a lot more study to keep get my brain wrapped around it but um, anyway so so the township Wiper Township actually functions very much like a city in many ways not always but very much like a city because they are in the metro area they are the only township remaining in Ramsey County and they are the largest there are 1800 townships in the state of Minnesota they are by far the largest most densely populated mm-hmm mm-hmm so, yes. There were some changes. Um, I'd have to look at the maps exactly, but there were some changes, and I know that even um, White Bear Township itself, because of the freeway, there's a little sliver that went to um, Maplewood and to Little Canada that um, they always, when I make my statement that they, you know, the cities of White Bear Lake, Gem Lake, uh, Badness Heights and North Oaks, and they always say, and don't forget you know, Maplewood and Little Canada. It was, it was fairly a small piece of land from what I understand, but um, yeah, so it, it very much, the freeways have done a number on <laughs> boundaries and things over the years, so. Hmm? I appreciate your question about White Bear Township because I'm always intrigued to see that big water tower that's off of Martin Way. By East County Line and just off Cedar, mm -hmm. and between Cedar and the lake, that says mm -hmm. White Bear Township. But I always think of it on the other And that's just it. Yeah, and there are pockets. It's five, basically, five little sections that are completely separate from one another. And I just soaked up your, your uh, presentation, Carol, because it brought back so many memories. But one <laughs> of the other things I wanted to share, remember we used to have incinerators in the backyards, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. was another thing. Um, also, as a Mariner graduate, um, <laughs> I'll remind you all that um, I was intrigued to hear you say you guys checked out modular scheduling because that's what Mariner had. But um, I was uh, there, I graduated in 75 and I was the first class to go all the years because the first year we didn't have any seniors because the class didn't want to break up. Sure. So that was kind of like fun. Another thing that my husband remembers growing up is that you used to collect glass bottles along the, the roads because cleaning up wasn't the thing back then and, and turning them in for two cents a bottle and that's how they'd raise money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much. Mm -hmm. My husband and I bought our first house in White Bear Lake in 1975 and we were, neither one of us had grown up in the metro area and we started to look for where we wanted we were looking at the northeast area, and when we came to White Bear, we looked at what the was like, yes, this was a community where it looked like people cared about the homes. Mm -hmm. And so our first house was on the Orchard Lane between the night and the Bel I think it was originally a family's house. Mm -hmm. um, but that just, it being a community
And again, I would I would say greater white bear with that, um, you know, all the way around the lake and a lot of the, the neighborhoods. Um, we hear that all the time. We actually have people come to the Historical Society to inquire about the community as a whole because they're curious about moving here and, you know, what are the trends and what's happening. And of course, we're not always fantastic with the current. We're trying to capture the current for tomorrow, but uh, we're not always great with today. We can tell you what it was like here, here, and here, um, and we try to bring it up to the modern time. But uh, yeah, that we hear that quite a bit, and, and, and a lot from families who came in the 50s, and the 60s, and the 70s, and the 90s, and, and all the way through. And um, people are choosing to be here. They don't just get here by accident, which I think is a pretty common thread. So. Yes, let me grab my notes to make sure I do it right. Uh, 19, let's see. Nineteen fifty, I know, was uh, for the city of White Bear Lake. Nineteen fifty was uh, three thousand six hundred forty-six people, and it was two point two five square miles. In nineteen sixty, the census showed twelve thousand eight hundred forty-nine people with seven square miles, because again, the, the land that was township was being annexed uh, to the city. And then by nineteen seventy. It was 20, 23,313 uh, population and approximately 8.7 square miles of land. So um, continuing to grow. And quite frankly, the, the city of Wiper Lake is about 23,400, 23,300 population now. So since 1970, it hasn't grown that much. I mean, from a, it goes up and down kind of around that number. The area around the lake has certainly continued to grow, um, and, and obviously to the north, we know um, the Hugo, Lino, kind of that, those areas are continuing to grow in the vicinity, but. Up on County Road E. Yes. Yep. Uh, actually, it's uh, our second biggest which surprised me when I looked at the study. I'm just like, I just, I know we've got that El Parente, that great restaurant there. Uh, if you if you like that style of food, it is wonderful. Uh, and, uh, but it is, uh, you know, for me, uh, navigating around is all based on food places. It's all about the food. So, yes, I know. So um, th th that school is for, um, it's early childhood currently, so not, um, you know, it's nice. To, they started in Roseville, as I, uh, as I recall, and have decided to move out here where there's maybe a need and a desire to have students, young ones, go through that kind of program. And they, they uh, hire um, uh, Spanish-speaking people, and you have to come from Mexico to be considered for a position there because uh, they want the... They want the language as authentic as possible. So, so Jackie said it's for families that want their kids to learn Spanish right away. Bilingual. bilingual. And that's what they, I think they call it bilingual academy or something of that nature. Talk. 
<laughs> my, my comment is, it reminds me of one anecdote uh, that we have captured over the years. Um, one of the families who lived in town for a long time, actually, they were at the a transitional age, they were at a retirement age, and they actually chose to leave the community because of the taxes going up, um, because of all of that infrastructure, as you can imagine, taxes had to have gone up. I mean, just there's no way to build all of that without raising the funds. Um, so they actually moved north out of the, the metro area. Um, and, and I don't think a lot of folks did that, but I do think that that was an impact for some. Um, the other piece that I will say is that the, as I showed some of the slides of the industry coming to town, part of the um, purpose of recruiting industry was to increase that tax base as well to try to so there was a lot of planning and a lot of pieces that went with that and now I'll let Kevin talk <laughs> so what happens when we only have one microphone with when, when the school thing comes out I, I can't be quiet <laughs> uh, it is the right thing to do to support our schools it's also in our Constitution at ed ed educated citizenry um, but one of the, th the things and I didn't get to this in my talk was that in Minnesota we have one of the highest opportunity gaps, achievement gaps, however you want to phrase it, in the nation. So 87% of our white students, this is in Minnesota as a whole, 87% of our white students graduate, 65% of our African American students graduate, 60% of our Latino students graduate, and it's less than 55% for American Indian indigenous. That is uh, obviously for a, a, on a personal side, that's a huge issue, but also on the workforce piece, we have the students to take the jobs. We just need to make sure that we do a better job of gradu having people graduate uh, from all backgrounds. And uh, so Wilson Tool and Schwang and one of these big employers say we need workers. The workers are all around us. We just need to make sure they graduate because graduation is the the gateway to a much better life. Carol, if you want to, you're a school board person too. Go on. Well, when I was in the school board in White Bear in the early 2000s, we did build Onika because of the growth in Hugo. There was a lot of growth happening. Uh, it was kind of interesting last week when they gave the uh, demographics of the growth and everything. And uh, Ralph Parsons and I, who were on the school board about the 2000s uh, kind of had to correct them about some of the numbers <laughs> because we had good uh, a very big population of students back then things fluctuate uh, the other thing is that the schools in the south side of white bear are becoming full again because those homes are turning over and so there's a lot of young families coming because those those ramblers and split levels are very affordable for families and so that's another thing that's been changing 